Welcome to another message from Bridge Assembly, located at 725 Granite Avenue in Helena, Montana. For more information on Bridge, go to our website at bridgehelena.com. It is our prayer that this message will help you to connect with God, connect with others, and connect others with God. Father God, we just surrender to you this morning, Lord God. We, we surrender to you with our lives, with our, with our problems, with our pride. And Lord God, where, where that existed, we, we now worship you. So Lord God, in this, in this building this morning, in this house this morning, Lord God, receive our worship. Lord God, we desire that we worship in spirit and in truth, and yet we bring so many problems and so many distractions here with us. And that's where we need you. We need your help. We need your direction. We need your teaching. We need your guiding. Lord God, there's so many things that that pull us in every different direction. So many things that that compete for our attention. There's there's, uh, pleasures. There's temptations. There's fears. But Lord God, in this time right now, as we we seek your face in prayer, Lord God, help us to lay all of those things down so that we can fully focus upon you. You're wonderful, Father. You are so wonderful. Jesus, we continually proclaim you as our Savior and our Lord, the true Son of God, the one who came and and died for each one of us. Lord God, help us to fix our eyes upon those statements, those, those realities. Jesus, You're everything that we need. So, Lord God, again, help us to focus upon you. Holy Spirit, we again ask you to be with us, not just this morning in this service, but to be with us every single day, every instant of every single day. Holy Spirit, we desire your wisdom and your discernment but we also just desire your comfort and your counseling. So Lord God, if there's any hurting hearts in here this morning, Lord, I know that you are there. You are ready. You are waiting. So Lord God, help us to lower our defenses and to seek you and only you. Jesus, we glorify you in this place. We will always glorify you in this place. We will always speak your name in this place. We will always exalt you in this place. We pray this in your mighty name, the mighty name, the the lion of the tribe of Judah, the God of angel armies the one that was and is and is to come, the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus, we speak your name with power and boldness. And we pray and ask in your name. And everyone shout it out. Amen. Amen. You guys can grab a seat. Thank you guys for being here. So much going on in the world. It's, I, I truly believe with, with, you know, some of the things we're seeing, and I'm not going to get into to these prophecies or those prophecies or, or anything like, Carl, can you bring those down just a hair? Those always get real bright, bright for me. Um, I'm just saying there's a lot going on, and, and being in the house of the Lord is a, is a really good place to be right? And to be uh, together with each other. Can we worship God on our own? Absolutely. And we better be doing that. But there's something when the body comes together and we can just join with each other in worship, in praise, in, in companionship, in edifying each other. The church, the church family is of vital importance. I will, I will continually speak that and I will continue to believe that. So thank you guys for being here. Let's dismiss the kids. Jordan's got the kids. It's going to be a good old time. Um, it's going to be awesome. So kids, you are dismissed to go downstairs.
awesome stuff. All right, I've got a few announcements that I absolutely have to go through this morning, but I'm, I'm, I'll be honest, I'm itching to get into this message. So let's hit some announcements. First announcement, how many of you guys in here are planning to go to the Edgewater Farms Corn Maze today? No, you're not, because they're closed. We just found out that Edgewater is closed today. But there's a whole nother corn mace, in a, and it's a much prettier drive to get there. It's right outside of Craig. You guys know where Craig is, right? On the Missouri River, world-class fly fishing. You guys know where Craig is. Come on, <laughs> don't let me down here. Um, so you just jump on the highway. Um, you can get off at the Craig exit. So the maze would be on the river right, right? So it's on the other side of the bridge. So you'll go through Craig, you'll cross the bridge, and I believe, if I remember correct, you'll then take a right, and it'll be right in there. But what's it called? Apple Jack? Apple stem. Apple something. Apple stem. Apple stem. Um, after service, and I'm talking like after service, don't cut out a service early by any means, but in the foyer, let's just meet up. The more we can take, the less it is to get in. Um, so it's like if we have 20 people, it's only $9 to get in. Um, and, it, and it looks really cool. And the, the drive there is, is amazing. So don't go to Townsend today because that would be the wrong place. Instead, go to Craig. All right, so that is Mostly right, but not all the way right. But they've got a big corn maze and they've got all the other things. So let's plan on doing that. And then let's see, next Saturday is West of 50s. And they will be going to the Lincoln um, Sculptures in the Wild. So that's Saturday, October 21st. If you're planning on going to that, meet here at the church at 9.30 a.m. So that you guys can carpool and then they're going to hit up some lunch in Lincoln afterwards. Lots going on. Um, 40 Days for Life. We're in 40 Days for Life right now. Uh, our day to go pray at Planned Parenthood is, uh, is Tuesday, October 21st. Really, we have the time span of 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. If any of you guys want to go and pray from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m., I'll bring you lunch. I'll bring a coffee, but we don't expect that, but we would like to uh, have you guys sign up for an hour, right? We have hour slots in there, so sign up for an hour or two. The sign up for that is under the TV in the foyer, um, but just please, this is important, right? There's so much going on. Prayer, prayer is monumental. Prayer is so vitally important. Let's see, and then we have trunk or treat. Trunk or Treat's coming up. That location is still here. That location will not change. Um, that is, it's going to be from, from 4 to 7. Um, Halloween this year, October 31st, is on a Tuesday. Come for the candy. Stay for the fun. We need more trunks, and we need more candy, and we just need people in general helping out. So um, if you remember when you're at the grocery store, I think Costco has real big bags of candy. Grab an extra bag, bring it here, drop it off in the morning. Amy is going to pass around the clipboard. Again, we have like, last, last week we had quite a few people gone, and now it seems like there's a quite a few other people gone this morning, but um, we had like eight or nine or ten trunks signed up, but we need more than that. We need, man, I would love... 18 to 20 trunks. That would be awesome. So we're going to send that around. Sign up if you want to have a trunk, if you want to host a trunk. Um, if you've never done it before, a lot of the trunks that we have have a little game to go along with it, and that can be super easy. I always do my, my fishing game, so they throw the, throw the fishing pole over, and then I clip a piece of candy and then tug on it, and they pull it up, and these kids are just amazed. Where did that candy come from? It's, it's just awesome. It's like a miracle. It's like the fish and the bread. I should start putting bread on there, right? The kids would be like, what does this mean? But it's a great way to meet the community, right? It's a great way to um, just get into conversations and everything. So please, please sign up to do a trunk. Um, sign up to, uh, to help 
all of those things and, and obviously bring candy. The more candy, the better. We'll still have the popcorn and the cider and the hot chocolate. We'll have all that going as well. And then uh, lastly, Operation Christmas Child. Um, Christmas is a little ways off, right? We don't really want to completely start thinking about the holiday of Christmas. We always think about Christmas, right? That's when, when Jesus came. But Operation Christmas Child, we have to get those boxes passed out, filled, and then back here and collected because we got to have, you know, there has to be time to get these these shoe boxes halfway around the world, and it makes an, an incredibly huge difference. So please, in the in the foyer, there's all the boxes. A lot of them are already put together. There's the slips. If you do more than one box, right? Some people like to do two or three boxes. You got to have a slip per box, um, right? And that's the different ages. And is it a boy? Is it a girl? Um, even really relatively the area that it's going. Um, but those boxes have to be back on November 19th. So I will continue um, to announce this because it's so important and it's so awesome. And, and stick a note in there about how you're praying for this, this young person that, that, you know, Jesus just blesses them. And, and man, we're a prosperous country. And in such, the love of Christ just, man, it, it, it causes us to want to give a little kid a, a, a shoebox full of good stuff halfway around the world through the love of Jesus. So please, um, I, yeah, we're a church. We do a lot of different things, and just seems like we've got so much going all the time. But uh, grab a shoebox. It's so much fun to do. Um, let's take offering. Four ways to give here. We, we do four ways to give. Um, you can give online. You can... Uh, you can text it. You can do a giving box. You can mail it to 725 Granite Avenue. Thank you for being a giving church. I'm going to ask something additionally or offer something additionally this morning. Um, in our board meeting Thursday night, we, we resolved and, and decided that as a church, we need to give an offering to a ministry in Israel with everything that's going on. So if you're feeling led um, to give an offering, to Israel, we're going to bring it all in, um, and we're going to pledge five thousand dollars to give as an offering. And whatever the congregation doesn't, we don't bring in with the congregation. We're going to make that up, um, but that's no excuse not to give to Israel. We need we need to give. We need to be praying for that region. We need to be praying God's will to be done. Obviously, God's will be done, but we want to be in alignment with that will. Um, so much going on, and we definitely want to keep Israel in our prayers. And uh, but there's a lot of humanitarian needs that are that are going right now. Um, I'm sure you've watched the news. Depending on what news you watch, you see different things. But we know that there's a lot of um, a lot of suffering, and that's that's really on both sides, right? Um, again, we trust in God, and and we want to trust Him not only with the situation in Israel, but we want to trust Him with our finances as well. Amen? Amen. 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 So please consider doing that. All right, you guys ready to get rolling here? Let's get roll. Let's pray before we get started in our message today. Father God, once again, it is, it's just wonderful. It's lovely. It's good to be in your house this morning. And Lord God, on some Sundays, it's just like, man, where else would I want to be right now than worshiping with my brothers and sisters in Christ and drawing nearer to you, and watching others draw near to you. Lord, it's a wonderful thing. So, so once again, we, we come this morning with a thankful heart. We appreciate the opportunity to be here, and to worship you, and to listen to your word, and to act upon that, and to have the availability of the Holy Spirit to come and just lay down before him. And Jesus, we exalt you once again. The Holy Spirit, allow me to say what you would have me to say this morning. Lord God, I don't want anything more than that, but I also don't want anything less than that. So help me to say what you have for me to say, but shut my mouth with anything else. 
And once again, Lord God, and I believe this is an impactful prayer, and it's a prayer that you answer. Lord, I pray that nobody leaves here today. They don't leave this building. They don't leave this parking lot the same way that they came in here this morning. Lord God, we anticipate and expect to be changed. And Lord God, we understand that, that in so many ways, that's us laying ourselves down and opening ourselves up so that you can change us. So Lord God, give us ears to hear. Give us eyes to see. Give us a heart to receive. Help us to not be afraid of condi- conviction. Help us to not be afraid of challenges. But help us to run to you, Lord. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus once again. And, and everyone shout it out. Amen. Are we going to be a loud church today or a quiet, a loud one? Oh, I love a loud one. Last, you know, last week, last week's message was, was um, very important. And if you were here, um, you'll understand why. And, and it was interesting because last week, if you noticed, we were a relatively quiet church. And that's okay, and I, and, and, and I understand that, and I take that as in, man, people were listening, they were engaging with the Holy Spirit, right? Those things were going on. So, so it's just interesting, depending on what, what Sunday it is, how loud we, we are. So if you've not been here, we are currently in a, in a series on the book of Colossians, an incredible book of the Bible, though it's a shorter book of the Bible, it is... It is so powerful, and it is so packed full of just incredible teachings. And really, the theme of of the book of Colossians is the supremacy of Christ. And as we have gone through this series, we, we, we have a better understanding why the book of Colossians, the letter of Colossians, was so vitally important for Paul to write. And many of those things that the Colossians were dealing with, faithful believers in the Colossians church, those things that they were dealing with, there was a lot of false teaching happening. There were a lot of false, false teachers that were coming against the church. Um, so Paul had to address that. And we see a, a, a serious parallel between what was going on then and what's going on now. And, and that makes this book so relevant for us today. This morning, we are going to be continuing in chapter 3. Of, of Colossians. And yes, we are on part 18 of this series. And yes, we are still only in the beginning of Colossians. Um, sometimes when I do a series, and most of you are saying most of the time when he does a series, it just, God says we need to slow things down because there's a lot in here that we need to really marinate on and we need to open up. So, so be patient with me. Like I said, we're going to get through this, this series unless the rapture happens, right? It might be 2024. It won't be 2025, but sometime we'll get through this, hopefully before Christmas. But um, the rate we're going, we're not getting a whole lot of verses each Sunday. And uh, that theme continues today. So let's remember really why Paul is writing to this church. There's three main reasons that Paul, Paul is writing. Three main emphasis, three main points. Number one, Jesus is central and supreme to all and in all things. Number two, Jesus is the Son of God. And number three, we are to strive to live a life in Christ. That's why Paul wrote this to the Colossian believers, but we can take this and now begin to apply it to ourselves by simply incorporating these principles into our prayer life. So we change it around to sound something like this. Jesus, you are central and supreme to me and in all things in my life. Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. Jesus, I will constantly and continually strive to live a life in you as my Lord and Savior. See, if we subscribe to these three principles right here, our life is going to be very different. Our life is going to be changed. It's going to be much better. It's not going to be easier, right? We don't want to, we, we don't want to preach that, that false idea that if you come to Jesus, your life is going to be perfect and easy and you're never going to have a trouble or a tribulation. We know that we still will. It's how we look at those trials and tribulations. It's how we look at fear. It's how we look at uncertainty. When we have the eyes of Christ, everything 
changes. Now we need to take these three principles and we need to remember them and, and we need to use it really as a, as a base of context as we look into our text today. But before we get into our scripture, I want to I want to try to help you to understand just how important last week's message was and those, those two verses we went through last week. See, chapter 3, if you remember, is, is really all about application. So really, chapter 1 is the supremacy of Christ. There's just a lot of important proclamations about Jesus happening. And then, then really in chapter 2, Paul shifts into the warnings, right? He's exposing what these false teachers are doing in a way that says, hey, that's what they're doing, but this is what you, you need to be doing. That's what they're trying to get you to look at, but this is what you need to look at. So from the supremacy to the warning, we get into chapter 3, and we really get into the practical application, right? Practical application is vital. And I myself just, I guess it's the way I'm wired and the way I look at things. I, I love practical application. Now there are some who get super excited about the theories of, of different things, right? There's all these different theories that can be studied, right? The theory of music, the theory of art, um, even um, scientific things, there's, there's theories. We can even study the, the theological depth of the Bible, right? Theological, the theory of the Bible, the theory of what's going on. It's the, it's the study, it's those principles, and that's great. And we need to do just that. We need to know our Bible. But for me, personally, it's the practical application that gets, gets really exciting, to me, it's, it's like, hey, I, I just learned this. Now I want to go out and I want to apply it. I want to use it. I want to put it into effect in my life. See, knowing the principles and the, the foundational truths of the scriptures is necessary in understanding our faith. And we have to know what we believe, right? Please be a Christian who knows what you believe. But practical application, on the other hand, is, is taking what we know, what we profess to believe, and, and actually living it out. Amen. That's the exciting part about following God, is living it out. It's where we put action to our belief, to our ideas, and to our words. And that's the kind of Christian that you need to be. And since God is a God of action, and since we are created in His image, and since the teaching of Jesus, they're all about activity and not just ideas, practical application now becomes a, a mandatory part of our faith. Would you agree that, that practical application is a mandatory part of our faith? I would totally believe that. See, being a born-again Christian is not a spectator sport. Being a born-again Christian is not just this thought and, and, and idea. So once again, I cannot stress the importance of, of chapter 3 and verses 1 and, and, and verses 2. I can't stress that enough. We can call it the, the seek and the set principle. And, and if you're sitting here going, I... I got no idea what pastor's talking about right now. The seek and the set. I wasn't here. I must have missed out on a whole lot. Well, well you kind of get did, but that's okay because technology puts it on Facebook and puts it on our website and puts it on YouTube. So please go back and listen to last week's message if you haven't yet. Okay, now keeping with the three main reasons why Paul is, is writing this letter in a in, in, you know, introducing this, this seek and this set principle in front of us. Let's look at chapter 3, verse 3 of Colossians. Turn there with your Bible. If you've got your paper Bibles, get ready to write some more. I love written up Bibles. Verse 3 says this, For you died to this world, and your new real life is hidden with Christ in God. We can think about verse 3 and really also verse 4, as the, the motivation for the actions we are compelled to in verse 1 and 2 of chapter 
3. See, 1 and 2 is about seeking and setting, and now, now we're going to find out a couple of the motivations to do just that. One of the main intentions for seeking and setting our mind on the things above, the things of Christ, is the faithful believer's union with Christ. Right? Um, Jesus isn't this far off entity that, that is just there and, and we can know him from a distance, right? Jesus is, is relational. We are to have a, a, an actual union with Christ. We, when we surrender ourselves and, and, and our connection with Jesus, um, becomes something that is so far beyond the world, right? We somewhat turn our back on the world. We say, no, I don't want anything else in this world. I want you, Jesus. At that point, we are joined with Christ, both in his death and in his resurrection. Amen. We die to ourselves, and through the process of death, we are reborn in Jesus. That's where we get the idea of being a born again Christian, right? John chapter 3 goes through that, that process. And this, this birth, this new birth that we experience, it, it gives way to our new life in Christ. And just like anything that is newly born, we then start growing, right? We start this wonderful growth process. We start, we start learning things that we've never known before, and we start becoming who God intends us to be. But here's the difference than many newborn things and what they experience. The difference is, and the exciting part is, is that growth and that learning and that becoming, it never ends. It never ends. We are never truly grown. We, we, we don't ever know everything. We are, we are never short of continuing to become more like Christ until the instant we step into glory. So it doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian, if it's been a few minutes, if it's been 50 years, God is always saying there's, there's more growth. There's more to learn. There's, there's more to be coming in Christ. That makes it so exciting. All of us are in process. We are all learning together, maybe at different stages. We're maturing at different rates, right? And that's how we all come together and we say, man, I think you could teach me so much. You've been a Christian for so long. And we say, I might have been a Christian for so long and, and I believe I could probably teach you some things, but, but you can teach me so much too. So let's learn about Jesus together. Let's seek Jesus together. And that's why practical application has to follow the intellectual knowledge we gain in our relationship with Jesus as, as guided by the Holy Spirit. James makes a, a dramatic statement. We find it in, in James 2.26. For just as the human body without the Spirit is dead, so faith without works of obedience is also dead. For you died to this world and your new real life is hidden with Christ in God. We first come to the understanding of death to this world, right? We first have to get to that point. We have to get to the point where, where this world is death. And if I am existing within this world, if I am governed by this world, I'm actually tied to that death. So we get to this understanding of death. And then by having faith in Christ, we begin to, to see his sacrifice, right? And then we come to the action of actually dying to this world. See, it's somewhat of a process. Some people are in process for a while. They're rationalizing this. They're trying to figure this out. The Holy Spirit's working on them. And there's other people who, who hear the gospel message and, and almost instantly they want to file through this process and they just want to cling on to God. And it's all right, right? There's no wrong way as long as we get to Jesus in the end. Amen. See, an action that, that, this is an action that comes through our, our surrendering and, and genuinely following Christ as our Lord and Savior. So right in the beginning, Jesus is all about wanting to be our Savior, 
once he is our Savior, then he must also become our Lord. And a Lord is something that is over, right? We are not equal with Jesus, right? Jesus is our Lord and Savior. And that Lordship, he doesn't exert that upon us as his slaves. He protects us and he guides us. And he loves us. It's wonderful to have Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And this has to be beyond just an idea. It has to be beyond just a prayer. It has to be beyond just attending church on Sunday morning. It is the action of acknowledging and confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. It is recognizing his power, his authority, his majesty as God, and believing in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. If that sounds familiar, it should. It's Romans 10.9. Go back and read Romans 10.9. It's a beautiful passage. And that action continues. As you turn from your old life and those things that you have died to, and you turn toward Jesus, and you start following him on a daily basis. Look at John 10, 27. The sheep that are my own hear my voice and listen to me, and I know them, and they follow me. What a, what a gorgeous, beautiful picture that is of our shepherd. And yes, you are sheep. I hope nobody is surprised about that. And if you know anything about sheep, it is a, it's a very appropriate example of really who we are. But we need the shepherd. And we need to know his voice. And he knows us. And he calls and we follow. Now I know most of you in here have heard all of this. And I'm so glad that you have. But I want, what I want you to understand is the importance of actually applying what you know. Isn't that where it all comes down to? By Paul stating these words in verse, in, in verse 3 of chapter 3, here in Colossians, he's, he's implying that those things that are apart or alien or foreign to Jesus should also be apart or alien or foreign to the born-again believer. Remember, I don't know, it was probably uh, probably late 80s into the 90s, it, the bracelets, what would Jesus do, yeah. right? That's, that's a great principle, but, but of course, like everything else, that got diluted into all sorts of other things. It became a, an actually a face, fashion statement. See, you were supposed to wear those bracelets, and, and when somebody would come up and say, hey, Mike, what, what's that bracelet all about? That was an opening to share the gospel, and then you were supposed to actually take your bracelet off and give it to that person, right? But it got to the point where people like their bracelets. It's fashionable. So I'm going to just keep my bracelet on and things like that. But we need to be putting into practice. We need to understand, okay, what would Jesus do? What would, what would Jesus approve of? What would Jesus disapprove of, right? And we need to say, well, if, if that's Jesus' mindset, if that's Jesus' attributes, I need to adopt those into my own life. That's not just in theory. That's also in application. It's in practical application. And that in itself can be a whole different challenge, can't it? Because we can sit here right now, Sunday morning, and I can share scriptures, and we can all agree, oh, that's good. That's, that's important. That's truth. I totally believe that, but when we leave here and, and the influence and the cares of the world come crushing down upon each one of us, when we go to our job tomorrow, when we, when we step into relationship or family dynamics, those theories can be really hard to transfer into the practical application. It's a challenge. I understand that. And more importantly, Paul under stood this. Look at, look at what Paul says in Romans 7. This is 19 and 20. For the good that I want to do, I do not do. 
but I practice the very evil that I do not want. Anybody relate to that? But if I am doing the very thing I do not want to do, I am no longer the one doing it. That is, it is not me that acts, but the sin nature which lives in me. See, we can have this understanding and it's this understanding that's based on faith. And we can even memorize all the scriptures that, that we need. But living it out can be hard because of the constant conflict with our sin nature that consistently wants to try to take hold of our lives. It's a battle out there. It's a true battle. So it's important in this battle between our human nature and the nature of God that we keep seeking and that we keep setting our mind upon those things that are above, those things that are of Christ and not the things of this world. Back to Colossians verse 3. For you died to this world and your new real life is hidden with Christ in God. The death with Christ is followed by resurrection with Christ. So our life, the life we now live, is indeed hidden with Christ. See, the Greek word used here for hidden is to conceal properly by covering. Right, that's what hidden means in, in this context. It's to conceal properly by covering. It means that we are kept laid up with God in heaven. See, when I read this, especially in light of the proper definition of hidden, I cannot help but to feel confidently secure in God's hands. doesn't matter what's going in my, on in my personal life right now. I'm confident that I'm held in God's hands. I can look again halfway around the world. I can watch the news. I can see what's happening in Israel. And, and if I have a, enough of a, of a knowledge of, of Old Testament prophecy, I can say, oh my gosh, look at all this. This is happening. This is making me fearful. But if I'm properly hidden in Christ, I know that God is good and that he holds me secure in his hand. See, that's what I feel. I actually feel that. And the practical application or the, the practical visual that now I live by has to take me back once again to Galatians 2.20. It seems like we go back to Galatians 2.20 a lot. I have been crucified with Christ. That is, in him I have shared his crucifixion. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith, by adhering to, relying on, and completely trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself to me. Amen. Look at the words of practical application here. And if you're in the Amplified Bible, underline them if, if you want. Words like crucified, shared, adhering to, relying on, completely trusting. What an incredible way to live our life and to live out our faith. Be encouraged. God is on his throne. Be encouraged. Jesus is the Messiah. So Colossians 3.3 3 tells us that the believer's life is not only secure, but it is also belongs in the, in the very real and in profound sense to the invisible spiritual realm, right? God is keeping us as we speak. Now let's look at verse 4, Colossians 3, verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And we just learned that the, the first motivation for seeking and setting our is, is, is really our union with, with Christ in, in his death as well as his resurrection. Now in verse 4, we find another motivation. It is the promise. 
for the believer's future realization of a life with Christ in glory for eternity. Hallelujah is right. How can we just not be like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. After all of what Christ has done for me now, I have the promise of a life with Christ in glory for eternity. See, one day, this, this connection between us and, and Christ, which is, which is truthfully, really, it's an inward experience, right? What's going on with our relationship with Christ? It's an, it's an inward experience. One day, it will come into full and open manifestation. We live with Christ in a spiritual faith right now. Right now, right here this morning, we live in a, in a spiritual faith with Christ. But today is just a part of eternity. And there is so much more. We are moving through this, this very minute, tiny little segment of eternity right here and right now. But a tangible eternity, a life with Christ, is what awaits the born-again believer eternity with Christ. You know we're all eternal beings. Every single person is this eternal being. And every little, every person will live forever. It just depends on location. Right? Those that don't know Christ don't cease to exist upon their death. They go to a horrible place called hell, which is a complete separation of Jesus and all his attributes. Those who know Jesus that are born again look forward to an eternity with him and all his attributes, love, hope, light itself, goodness, patience, compassion, understanding, relationship, all of those things. That's what we can look forward to. And with confidence in our Lord and Savior, we can not only look forward to it, we can expect it. We can expect it. We don't say that boastfully, not boasting in our own arrogance or our own um, effort, but we boast in Christ. And in Christ, we can expect it. So we keep seeking and we keep setting our mind on the things that are above, the heavenly things, not on the things that are on earth, which only have temporal value. This earth is passing away. Many of the things that we invest our time and effort and finances and all those, though they may give us some enjoyment, those are temporal. Those are passing away. They don't have an eternal impact. This stuff is so great because it is so practical. It's so practical for us right now as well as practical for us in an eternal sense. See, when we come to Christ, we die to our past life and he becomes our life. We call him our life because Jesus is literally the essence of our life. That can be hard to wrap our brains around, at least for me. I can't totally wrap my brain about my life um, being so intertwined with Jesus that it's no longer my life yet, yet my heart is beating and I am breathing and, and I can do things on my own. I can make choices upon my own. So it's, it's really hard to, to wrap our brains around. But Jesus gives us life where once only death lived. And I think that we can come to understand just a little bit more. But he also nurtures us in that life. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that God is an active God? He is a relational God. He nurtures us in our life. He sustains us in his life, which is eternal life. Look at Romans 8.10. In Christ, if Christ lives in you, Though your natural body is dead because of sin, your spirit is alive because of righteousness, which he proves. I once heard a uh, physiologist say that, that as soon as you're born, as soon as you're born, your body starts to decay and die, right? How many of you guys can relate to that? 
oh yeah, yeah, I feel that, that, that decay, or if it's tooth decay, if it's whatever. It's just, as soon as we're born, I had a I had a uh, orthopedic surgeon say basically as soon as you're born as soon as you're born your joints start to develop arthritis. It's not an all of a sudden I have arthritis now that arthritis start, started as soon as you were born. So our natural body is is death, right? It's continually dying, but our spirit doesn't have to be. Our spirit is to be alive in Christ and through his righteousness our spirit is eternal. Look at these words we find in, in Isaiah 46, 4 about how God will sustain us. Even to your old age, I am he. And even to your advanced old age, I will carry you. I have made you and I will carry you. Be assured I will carry you and I will save you. What an amazing passage of Scripture right there. We need to cling to Scriptures like this, right? Man, even to my old age, even to the, the edge of glory, that moment before I, I step into glory, He's going to carry me, right? Because I have a relationship with Him. And then I'll have an eternity with Him. We as born-again believers, see, we keep one eye on eternity, and we, we look to those things that will come and we keep our other eye on the opportunities that God is placing in our life here and now. Occupying and engaging now until we see Him face to face. And that keeps us focused and that keeps us about our Father's business. Holding our gaze with an eternal focus, bolsters and builds us up in the things to come. And that's how we get through our life, day to day. Because sometimes our life isn't easy. It's how we deal with this time on earth. In the hard times, we live in the promise of glory. In the tragic times, we know a day is coming where all tears will be swept away. In the trying times, we stand firm in Christ and the hope of eternity. What does this really look like? Well, I'll tell you this. It looks like nothing that we can even imagine. Look at 1 Corinthians 13, 12. For now, in this time of imperfection, we see in a mirror dimly a blurred reflection, a riddle, an enigma. But then, when the time of perfection comes, we will see reality face to face. Now I know in part, just in fragments, but then I will know fully, just as I have been fully known by God. Amen. There's so much that we don't understand. And there's so much that we can't yet understand. And do you know what? That's okay. We don't have to understand everything. We stand firm on those things that that we can fully place our hope in, right? The important things, you know, the important things like God is good. God is good. The things, the understanding that, that Jesus saves and wants a relationship with us. That ultimate healing and hope is found only in Jesus. That the Holy Spirit desires to comfort, to teach, and to guide us every single day. God will sustain us until we step into glory. And that nothing in this world is too big or too hard or too tragic when we are alive in Christ. We have to remember the promise of God is an eternal promise and that that promise will hold true. God's not going to switch up the rules on us. He's not. He established that so long ago. And he will honor that. And of course we need to remember that Jesus is coming back. Yeah. Jesus is coming back. When? We don't know. We look at the seasons and all that. But we have to acknowledge and understand and look for the return of Jesus. So no matter what this broken and this fallen world tries to throw at you,
No matter what trials and tribulations you may be going through, fear not, because Jesus overcame the world. Here's a, here's a couple of verses starting in 1 Peter 5.10. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who imparts his blessing and favor, who called you to his own eternal glory in Christ, will himself complete, confirm, strengthen, and establish you, making you what you ought to be. Amen. Let's look at the next one. Romans 8, 18, for I consider from the standpoint of faith that the suffering of the pr present life are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is about to be revealed to us and in us. Amen. Amen. Let's, uh, let's go to 2 Corinthians 4, 17. For our momentary light distress, this passing trouble, is producing for us an eternal weight of glory, a fullness beyond all major, suppressing all comparisons, a transcendent splendor, and an endless blessedness. This is Paul writing this, right? Paul, if you know anything about Paul's life, Paul went through all sorts of stuff, right? shipwrecks and, and people trying to kill him. Man, he got, he got stoned by, by the, the Pharisees and they were busting stones on his head. They thought they had killed him and they dragged him outside of the city limits because they didn't want a dead body in there. But he wasn't dead. He woke up, he comes back in and, and he starts preaching. He gets bitten by a venomous snake and he just shakes it off into the fire. He, he lived a life where he was a tent maker. And when he wasn't making tents, he was in prison, right? He died a death of martyrdom. They cut off his head. So from Paul's perspective, he's saying, for our momentary light distress, this passing trouble, I don't think any of us are going to experience the, the distress that Paul did, and yet he's calling it momentary and light in light of eternity. Worship team, if you guys want to quietly come up here. I'm going to talk to each and every one of you in here. Go ahead and bring those lights down right, right now. Let's, let's, let's drop the lights. We want it intimate in here. Tune out everybody else. I'm not talking to the people that are around you. Right? I'm talking to you. I'm talking to each one of you. If this morning you cannot confidently identify with Christ and His promise, if you have any question about your eternity, your eternity where you will spend it, your eternity with Jesus, maybe you just want to affirm your faith in Him this morning with no condemnation from anyone in here this morning. Just give me a hands up. Give me a nod. Because I want to pray for you. And I want to pray with you. See, this is just too important. With the way this world is going, the things that we are seeing, the, the, the open defiance and, and deception, those things that we are witnessing in the, the Middle East. This is just too important to put any of this off. So I'm going to pray. We're going to go back into this song. I'm going to invite you to the altar this morning. Once again, I don't know where you're at. I care where you're at, but I don't make a a uh, requirement that you have to be in a certain place or not to come to this altar. Like the song says, just come to the altar. We come to the altar in practical application, right? It takes effort. It takes a physical effort to come to the altar. Can God meet you in your seat? Yes. But there's a humility and a surrender when you make that walk to the altar. And I'm not talking about, oh, this bad person must have done this. they got to get right with God at the altar. Maybe that is true. 
But sometimes we just need to come to the altar to affirm our relationship with Jesus, to worship with Jesus, to bask in the Holy Spirit. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Sounds like something that we need to be doing. So with hearts wide open this morning and allowing the Holy Spirit to come in and, and to speak and to, to gently correct and to maybe 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 so wonderfully convict. If if God is nudging you at all this morning, I ask you, do not let this time get away from you. This is the point of the service called the response and it's so very important and valuable so would everybody stand up and let's let's pray let's pray for ourselves let's pray for those around us father lord as you sent your son to be the sacrifice the only true sacrifice the only worthy Sacrifice, the only complete sacrifice. Lord, we thank you for that. Lord God, help us to identify with his death, but help us to also identify with his life and his resurrection. Let us have a comprehension of, of being in, in oneness with you, Father, to be in relationship with you, Father. And let us also have a perspective of eternity and and what lies ahead of us. Jesus, we thank you for everything that you have done. We thank you for everything that you continue to do. And, and Jesus, when you walked this earth, when you taught on this earth, you made a profound statement. You said that you must leave so that the Spirit could come and Lord God, you ascended. Jesus, you ascended back to the Father. And, and you gave us your wonderful and perfect Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, as you speak to hearts this morning, Lord God, also give them confidence and a boldness to step out in that faith, in practical application, and to meet this morning at this altar. Jesus, we trust in you. Father, we know you have the authority to do whatever you want. So we pray your will. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, for the teaching and the comfort that you give to each one of us. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Our altars are open. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior, what a glorious Savior who seeks and saves those who are lost. He is the shepherd who is after those wild sheep and he brings them in gently and they, he teaches them his voice and the, and, and the sheep begin to crave the shepherd's voice. It's a wonderful time, you know, in the, in the Bible it talks about how, how there's, there's an event that can happen and, and all heaven rejoices right the angels rejoice and I'll tell you this the angels are rejoicing this morning they're rejoicing this morning and as should we so so as we we get dismissed today I want to leave here rejoicing praising the name of God having the name of Jesus upon our lips and, and as we transition into the rest of the day, maybe we go to the corn maze, maybe we, we go do whatever. Let us never distance ourselves or separate us our, for, uh, ourselves from, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We need to be thankful and we need to be rejoicing. And that in itself speaks volumes to this world. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for everything that transpired. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this time of worship. Lord God, I pray a blessing upon this congregation as we leave this building different than how we came in. Once again, we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone shout it out. Amen.
This concludes today's message. We hope you can join us next Sunday for services beginning at 10 o'clock a.m. at Bridge Assembly located at 725 Granite Avenue in Helena, Montana. For more information about Bridge Assembly, go to bridgehelena.com. And we hope you can join us next Sunday with Pastor Jason Metz.